Um, thanks for, first uh, to the organizers uh, to organize for Asia in person again. Big thanks to Omfuk and the whole team. I'm very happy after four years to be, four years to be back. Um, for most of the time, we were not allowed to leave Japan. Uh, well, actually, we were allowed to leave Japan, but we, but we were not allowed to enter it again. So that wasn't really an option for us. Um, so I'm quite happy to be here. Um, we are talking. So this is on the AI track. So it will be a bit less. Um, about open source, but actually I think there's one reason, because open source is so permeating to the whole industry, that you don't have to talk about it. All, every, every work we do in AI, everyone uses AI libraries nowadays, right? That is the, the big uh, advantage. So what um, Mario already said, we have two talks here. This one is about uh, the AI part, but don't worry, we don't have a lot of mathematics slides on it, so don't run away. Um, this, we have a second part on the ML ops, DevOps part, and how to get an AI system running in a yeah, rather big environment, you will see. Okay, so what we will do, we will go over some um, introducing ourselves quick, then about what Mercury is, because I guess most of you don't know about it, uh, the state of search in Mercury, and then a bit of technical stuff about how to improve uh, search results and learning to rank, and then key takeaways. So let us start with the introduction. So Alexander here, um, he joined Mercury like two years ago, a bit more than two. He has um, a huge experience in, in all kinds of um, famous places. Actually, he pulled me into Mercury because he moved very close to the place I live in Japan. We call it the, the Inakaku group because we are living on the other side, um, not in Tokyo. And so he is, yeah. He, uh, thanks to him, I joined Mercury a bit later. This photo is uh, a, a, sent, a friend of, as a colleague sent me, um, while I was complaining about doing Google Slides, because I'm an old style guy, I use LaTeX and produce PDF, and he said, now that this is how I imagine you when you complain about Google Slides. Yeah, I thought that is quite fitting. Um, Okay, so first about Mercury. So that is actually, it was nice that, that Han Fuk brought up sustainability because actually Mercury was founded out of one reason uh, with the idea to create something which is called within the Mercury speech a circular economy. It's about reusing and trying to be more sustainable. That was the original idea of the founder 10 years ago. So it was founded 10 years ago. It, we have now offices in the UK and in the US. Um, it's at the core, we have lots of other businesses going on. At the core is a client to client. So people sell their stuff and to other users. Very easy. Um, and of course, if you look at, so you see here, this is more or less how the application looks now. Sorry, it is all in Japanese uh, because, well, it's only Japanese market. There is a Mercury a US application is a bit different, but since we are from Japanese, yeah, you will have to be with that. Um, so the main way to interact with the application is via search, right? You're searching for stuff. To, so I often buy stuff from my daughter, like ski boots and this kind of stuff. I mean, that have been used once or twice, I don't mind. Um, so this core functionality is provided by Elasticsearch, another open source, big open source project. Um, I guess most people in, who have a bit an idea have heard about Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch provides already an excellent uh, way to uh, document retrieval. And yeah, we, that is what the basic use. So a bit of the numbers we are having here. So we have about 150 billion yen. That's about 1 billion US dollar per year. As net sales, uh, 20 million months, monthly users. Uh, hundreds of millions of active listing and that you get an idea about so we had thousands and thousands of search requests per second so that is the dimension we are we are speaking about here and so when Alex joined in April 21 the state of search was just basic we just throw the search query with a bit of tricks at Elasticsearch and get results back and that is then displayed to the user right Okay, that works. Actually, it works quite nicely, but I mean, there can be improvements, right? And if you're in, the, in this industry and in the area about yeah, search and search improvements, then uh, there are a lot of techniques to improve search results with machine learning. So what we were trying to 
build up on this regular text-based retriever. Uh, Elasticsearch doesn't do anything special. It's just use word tokens, whatever this is. So single words with it, and it retrieves the best matching document. That quite works quite nicely. But well, what we wanted to go better than that, uh, get over this, and that is called re-ranking. So looking into what is the state of the art of re-ranking. I will talk about shortly what re-ranking is, so don't worry. And also how we can be improved over time over this, right? This is not, uh, this is not like a process is once done and then, okay, we finished. Uh, would be nice, uh, but there are always improvements permanently. So what is re-ranking? In a simple image, like that is a search result, uh, searching for spots is like training trousers for <laughs> in Japanese. And what you actually want is that the more relevant stuff, right, the more the, those items that have a higher probability to be sold are higher up in the list, right? I mean, because, well, at the end, we, if an item that could be bought by a user is on the sixth search page, he will probably not find them. So it's better to move them up. This is, this is what real ranking is doing, basically. So in more abstract terms, so this is what you get from the search, from Elasticsearch, from your basic text search. And what you want to do is to increase the relevance, right? You want listing queue is more relevant to the user who is currently searching. So that's all about, well, well what is the reason? Well, it's of course, well, increase uh, money, right? I mean, we want to sell more, but we want that more people use the platform. So that's somehow what we are aiming at. Um, so the, the basic setup it was all done. So we have the Mercury application here that's at the center and we have the, the index with the elastic search that was all already here in 21. That was our basic setup. And the aim was how can we improve on top of this by just throwing in something that takes the results from Elasticsearch and then just reorders them in some way using machine learning. So that is that is what was developed over the, let's say, last two years while it is in. Um, yeah, and I think here I pass over to... Are you here on my side? Hello, hello. Thank you. So I will try to cover Robert Norbert. First of all, thank you. I will try to cover the ML side of things. And just to clarify what uh, Norbert has said previously, the later uh, versions of Elasticsearch are fairly flexible. You can uh, incorporate some ML models and to do fun stuff uh, during indexing time, for example, natural language processing. But it's rather limited when you want to integrate uh, other signals that would add personalization to the search results, for example, user activity or something, something else. So that's the previous architecture diagram. <laughs> uh, so this, I will get back to this. This is a pretty common setup, overly, overly, super overly simplified from a very high level. You have the first uh, phase, which is where you're recalling results from the index, solar, elastic search, something else. And then you have the other thing, which takes the results from the first phase and uh, integrates some other signals that add uh, personalization. For example, a recommendation system often work like that. When you, if you use Amazon or use Netflix, uh, that's how recommendation algorithms work. Uh, they add more signals to the search results when they, or recommendation list when they recommend you stuff. Uh, for example, what you did yesterday, what you did in the past, your browsing history, what are the users in your area, your age, your, your, with your interest doing. Um, right. Uh, da, da, da. So we, decided that yes, we need some sort of a machine learning approach, but what is that machine learning approach? So there is uh, an area in information retrieval field which called learning to rank, which is basically a set of algorithms uh, in which are supervised machine learning algorithms, uh, which help you to apply machine learning techniques uh, to add some sort of relevance aspect to the search result, relevance as it pertains to the user that's browsing or searching. 
So, uh, so how to choose the algorithms, how to apply it. So there are many uh, LTR al algorithms available. And luckily for us, there are open source frameworks that already provide implementation of these algorithms. So you don't have to write them from scratch. And uh, the way those algorithms work is they approach the ranking problem differently. For example, there are algorithms that uh, mm, uh, consider documents independently uh, of each other, uh, how, it, how those documents are relevant to the query, there are, which is called pointwise. There's the pairwise approach where documents compare to, uh, in pairs and the listwise approach. So you have the whole result set returned from the first phase of trivial and all that, uh, all those documents together uh, evaluated in terms of the relevancy. Right, so we went with the TensorFlow ranking framework, which is the TensorFlow module, which, si which sits on top of the TensorFlow core. And the reason being is because Mercari is rather maybe TensorFlow oriented, so it was kind of more natural for us to choose this framework. But to note, uh, this is not the only framework out there. We just ran with it and decided to give it a go. It's backed up by Google. So there is some uh, activity around uh, on the GitHub around that. So we decided, let's check it out. Right, uh, so, so yeah, um, first of all, so how to start? So we took an uh, authoritative approach. We uh, create a simple model uh, by choosing a, a set of simple features. And uh, we were hoping to iteratively, iteratively progress uh, and see how our efforts help the search relevance at Mercari. Now, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we use the supervised machine learning approach where we, we need to label our data. So how do we label uh, the data and what is the label signal? So the most obvious one is click because when you search for something and you want to preview it or you show interest, you make a click. But um, there is a problem with that. Clicks are noisy because human behavior is that, that human users just click on stuff. And it doesn't mean that click means uh, something is relevant. And the opposite is also true. It doesn't mean that when there is no click, it doesn't mean that uh, the item that was not clicked on is not relevant. Also, clicks are biased. Normally, human users tend to click uh, at the to, on the top results more than they would click at the bottom results. So, for example, if you search for monkeys, if you like monkeys, and you get back 120 items of various documents that speak about monkeys. Normally, you would see majority of the clicks, let's say, top 20, 30 results, which means um, uh, if you have relevant results at the bottom, they would never get clicked on because the, most of the clicks are at the top, uh, which means when you generate a data set for machine learning, um, the labels would be kind of biased, which uh, leads to problems like uh, position bias and then selection bias in the data set, where you have this loop where you constantly retrain your models on the biased label, uh, biasly labeled data set. Also, it depends on your application business domain, clicks may not be a good enough signal. For example, it may be a good signal in web search. For example, uh, when you search something and you Google present your search results and user clicked on a given search result, it can be considered a relevant result. But in a C2C marketplace, uh, clicks may not always lead to a purchase. So users click and preview a lot, but doesn't mean that what they click on, they would purchase. So when we label the data, simple click, uh, will not be good enough. So we need some sort of other signals that would help us to teach the model, to teach the machine learning algorithm, what is the, how the model should learn. Right, so as I mentioned, uh, clicks are binary labels, which means it's either clicked or not, relevant or not relevant. This is not good enough. 
So we mm, adopted approach to create graded relevance labels, which means we incorporate other business events when we compute what should be the label. For example, if user clicked on something, uh, started, made a comment or liked an item, started a purchase process and then purchased, it means uh, this user event behavior journey with the application, it can be a good label. So what the, our approach is not novel, and like other companies uh, approach this more or less the same way. Uh, so, so depending on the business domain, you have to adopt your labeling strategy. Also, <clears throat> of course, uh, as a general uh, statement in machine learning, uh, what you what data you give to a machine learning algorithm, you will get the output accordingly. So uh, it's to have uh, features, to have good uh, features. Of course, it's very very essential. So apart from the um, mm, deciding what should be our label, we also experimented with number of different features uh, as we were trying to train model. <clears throat> So uh, to touch a little bit about the metrics and uh, what I said earlier about business domain. There are a set of uh, very common uh, metrics in information retrieval uh, domain, which is which called NDCG, normalized discounted cumulative gain. It's a metric that um, calculates the precision of your relevance uh, applying uh, behavior which means the higher the NDCG score, it means uh, users see uh, results that are more relevant to them, which means they would click higher on a uh, search results, which is what we want. But a higher NDCG score or any other metric does not mean that the company is actually making more money. So for, in terms of the numbers, you may see higher NDCG score, but uh, sales went down. All right, now we're back to you. And, uh, and the key takeaways. Okay, um, thanks a lot for the, the details. I hope you weren't overwhelmed by the, the mathematics. Well, it wasn't that much, at least from my side. So a few of the key takeaways that if you want to implement something similar, right? It is not, we, have, we are not a big team. We could pull this off in short time for a large scale company. So they're using, just basic off-the-shelf open source technologies you can do. Here are a few hints you should take care if you want to look into this. The first is, well, as already mentioned, bad data in, bad data, bad uh, output. Um, you have to need good structured data and proper uh, engineered features. That is actually the most difficult part. This has nothing to do with software. This has with looking at your users. What, what they are doing and what could be relevant. Cleaning your data, of course, um, it's necessary. And uh, invest a lot of time in quality data labeling. It's, um, it sounds crazy. We, as you mentioned before, we have 20 million monthly users. Uh, how many searches per second? Of course, you cannot manually label that. That is not possible anymore. So you have to think about good indicators for what could be a sign that the user is engaged, interested in a certain. That is, the, that is the main thing you have to do if you want to set up a good AI system. Um, then keep an eye on NDCG. So NDCG is used everywhere, right, for search results, but we have seen it again and again. If you actually test stuff, uh, business KPIs, so your actual company or engagement, whatever, does not really go along always the NDCG. So things have to be careful a bit. Um, so, yeah, the general structure is, yeah, very general wisdom structured in. Um, so for the feature engineering here, it's like, did, can you, I mean, if it's, if it's possible, you're all, it's good to include into the user interface something that user can give you feedback. That's the optimal stuff, yeah? That was not a good search page. That was not interesting or that was interesting. Even if you get very few of them, they will help you to improve your search results. 
it is something that unfortunately is very hard to do um, because lots of people get annoyed uh, if it's done badly. And so, yeah, one has to be careful. Um, cleaning your data, I mentioned already, bad data in, bad data out, bad data out. So the same happened with extreme outliers. So you won't believe what humans are able to do. So we have examples of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of clicks on items in, uh, in succession by humans. Um, we are very surprised what, what some of our users are doing. Um, so that means you have to actually create your data in a, in a good way. Uh, good data labeling. So as I said, this is something where you can actually iterate. So it's not that you have to come up with a genius solution for all your problems in the first step. We never did this. We started with binary, very trivial labels, and then improved incrementally, right? So this is what we call graded level. So this, like when liked or when commented, so we give it a certain graded relevance level. And this is a way how you can start quickly off with a nice off-the-shelf system to, to provide uh, re-ranking stuff. Um, yeah, I mentioned this already, the NTGT blind side. So it doesn't mean if the NTGT value is good that you get really a serious improvement. Just be careful for that. Yes? So a little bit more on the blind side, uh, in terms of the number itself, the metric might be high, but if your first stage retrieval, your index gives you absolutely horrible results as it matches the query to the documents which are indexed. So in terms of the NDCG, it may be high, but the results still not relevant to the user because you, you could have just ranked poor results. Yeah. So your metric goes up, but your users are still unhappy. So that's where the blind side is. Don't just look at the number and think you solved all, or your, yeah. your element solution is working great. Okay, uh, last but not least, so this is, this is an open problem. And there, are, there are lots of conferences only related to search in AI. Uh, there are a lot of things we can do. Unfortunately, we are running out of time. I just show you the slides. A few ideas one could implement. I don't, I don't say start with that if you want to implement something similar. Start with something simple, but there are a lot of things what is now, let's say, the apex of technology or what most people are using, then you can progress to this. Okay, uh, time is over. Thanks for your interest here. Um, we are open for, I think, one or two short questions, I guess, um, if there are. Well, no questions then. Thanks everyone for that. Oh, wait, sorry, there wasn't. I didn't see. Uh, actually, um, the second talk by the two here sitting here, and we go in more details, uh, ML ops. Um, so we split this because we don't have that much time. The, we have a second talk on Saturday, uh, which goes into uh, ML ops and implementing and discussing. So, but it's all off the shelf stuff, I would say, um, nothing specific. Thanks. Yes, Marco. Yes, because they then actually purchase something. Yes. Uh, yeah, so uh, Marco, the question was, I will just repeat it for everyone else. Uh, we mentioned that there is a very weird user behavior and? Actual user or robots. So yes, of course, this is a huge problem. Rob, uh, bots, uh, we all know that 90% of the traffic of the internet is consists of bots. Um, we have indication that they make purchases. So that could still be a bot, but yeah, so hard to see. We identified like very consistent clicking behavior pattern from our data. It doesn't look like it was a human. So, and there is like huge amount of clicks. So there is certain indications which will help you to identify the bots and you need to clean that out when you prepare your training data set. Okay, I think time is out. Thanks a lot for your attention and um, yeah. We, are, we have a sponsor table if you have questions, we are around. <laughs>